Well, hello everyone. Welcome back for round two. We are, uh, sp we've spent some time talking about the different tools in Proteo Wizard, uh, kind of glancing by the fact that you could do co data conversions within it. Uh, in this talk and in the demo after it, we'll be talking about uh, doing some of the advanced methods for uh, data format conversion within Proteo Wizard's MS Convert. Uh, and uh, a lot of these are, are rather finely, finely grained features, but in some cases you can do some fairly powerful things with them. So I'm going to try to walk through them. Most of the functionality I'm talking about is really only accessible in the command line version of MS Convert, which means that we're going to have to do stuff on the command line, even though that's a little less happy. Okay. Uh, so we'll start with uh, some discussion of what kind of formats you can deal with in Proteo Wizard. From there, we'll talk about some of the different filters that are available within it. We're going to just take this kind of a step at a time as we walk through some of these filters. There are plenty of them. Um, and finally, we'll talk about the things that we've done to support uh, particularly Waters instruments, but these are, um, these are methods that can be used in basically any kind of peak listing task that you want to take on. So uh, these slides should have been on the thumb drive as well. This is the, the letter B one for the Proteo Wizard set. I believe that there were three publications uh, that you had accessible to you. So one was the Kessner paper that introduced Proteo Wizard in the first place. One was the Chambers paper that talks about file format compatibility. And the third one is from uh, Jay Holman that talks about the, uh, the application of different filters uh, in Proteo Wizard conversion. This table is actually one of the papers from Jay Holman's paper. Um, but it tries to walk through what we can convert. Now, I've been a little specific in certain places, and I, I'm going to try to walk through what those mean. So, AB SciX instruments, uh, most contemporary AB SciX instruments write WIF files. Um, those WIF files are often uh, written in uh, WIF scan pairs, so you'll end up with uh, some files that are called WIF, and you'll have the same file with the end name .scan instead. So, those files are read together. So, although we're kind of accustomed to a paradigm where each input raw becomes one output MZML, uh, in lots of instruments we have to have the ability to group together files for reading. So, the WIF scan pairs would be one example of that. The T2D format is not really intended to be a file format at all. Um, older AB SciX instruments like the 4700 uh, write data to, uh, I believe, an Oracle database. And the objects in that Oracle database can be exported as T2D files, where each T2D file represents a different scan. Those T2D files uh, can be converted in Data Explorer to other formats. And helpfully, uh, we've created this, this capacity within Proteo, within Proteo Wizard to connect to Data Explorer in order to get access to those T2D files. So, this is one of those, those things where if you, if you actually want to do this, you have to have both Data Explorer installed and the 32-bit build of Proteo Wizard, because the 64-bit build can't talk to the 32-bit Data Explorer. So Data Explorer it's, itself is not a library per se, but it can be talked to in this way that allows it to be used as a medium for the data exchange. Now with Agilent, I've said Mass Hunter is great. Yes, we can read Mass Hunter files, no problem. Uh, you, you see these .d directories that uh, are created by uh, Agilent instruments. Those are all absolutely fine. Uh, there are some older models of instruments made by Agilent, though, that we can't read. Um, first off, I would note that a trap made by Agilent back in the old days uh, was co-marketed with, I believe, Bruker. Uh, and so in order to read a, uh, a trap file from an Agilent instrument, we have to use the Bruker library, which is a little confusing. But um, ChemStation instruments, uh, which I believe are uh, GCMS style instruments, uh, we can't read. Uh, we don't have uh, the, the, li the library that we have access to from Agilent doesn't give us the ability to read those ChemStation files. Bruker is complex uh, because there's a whole host of different file formats that are produced by Bruker instruments. So we have uh, FID files. There's another called BAF and another called yep. Uh, we frequently find bath and yep files in directories called .ds, and we read those. So uh, I think anything written by Bruker instruments we can read. Uh, 
but all of that has to go through um, this, this conversion uh, support stuff. Um, we also uh, have a special, uh, a special mode of uh, Bruker exports that we can read, which is called their XMAS XML format. So having run an experiment on a Bruker instrument, you can export the data off to XMAS, and from that you can read it in Proteo Wizard. Thermo has produced raw files since forever. Uh, they, they also have produced ISIS, uh, ISIS files, I guess, way back in the day, in the, uh, the TSQ 700 days and so on. But uh, anything that their libraries can read, we can read. Because their libraries uh, are basically, uh, they're, they're one of the best in the industry, really, just uh, in, in terms of the span of time that you can read from. So an LCQ or even a TSQ 7000 would write raw files, I believe. And those same raw files are readable today using their libraries. So all, all fine there. Waters has been uh, a long-standing problem for us, um, and yet I believe that we now have everything in place to allow complete reading of, of Waters data. So uh, they have one of the fastest libraries out there now for, for data access. Uh, it doesn't offer all of the functionality we would like, and we'll talk about that uh, at, at greater extent later on in the talk. So I've mentioned these other ones, uh, at least in passing. I want to walk through them, though. Uh, the MZML format was uh, the one that was formul formulated by the uh, Kubo PSI group. They've really done a, a very good job at allowing for a, a wide diversity of kinds of information that we store in each file. Uh, MZMLs are, in a lot of ways, the standard for the field now. And I think that, that will probably be true for the metabolomics field as well. There's nothing in an MZML to make it proteomic in nature, really, so I think that this is a, a very extensible effort. The MZXML effort is, is still alive. There are plenty of uh, software packages out there that, that require data provided in that format. Um, we still support it. We, we're still up to date, I think, on it. Uh, there may be some variants of MZXML out there. Um, when, when you have a, a specific versioning process in place that says, this is what this format shall look like. Uh, you tend to get files that are much more uh, usable across platforms. MZXML has, over time, picked up all kinds of different little flavors and subtypes. So it may be that information is present in an MZXML file that we don't uh, expect and therefore we don't read. So that's a, that's kind of a shortcoming with uh, kind of the sprawling uh, kind of the sprawl and creep that we've seen as the MZXML has tried to cover a wider a wider array of roles. Um, I mentioned that um, the Yates Lab produced their own formats, but I might, might explain some of the backstory with it. Uh, the Yates Lab decided not to not to board the XML train, essentially. Uh, when when we looked at what what file sizes were produced in attempts to convert to uh, MS data M MZ data, which was the pre the precursor to MZML, uh, or uh, even to MZXML, we found that the file sizes were bloating so much that we didn't want to really go that route. And so um, the MS2 and MS1 and CMS2 and BMS2 file formats are, uh, are all different ways to represent in large text files, but without all the overhead of XML, uh, the information contained in raw files. Um, unless you are in the Yates lab or the Macos laboratory, you're probably not going to be running these, these particular tools. But it's, it's worth knowing that there's this great uh, diaspora of formats out there. Hopefully, uh, Hanno Steen's group uh, up at, uh, at Harvard had some, uh, uh, they, they, they wanted to create a file format that scaled really well for very large volumes of mass spectrometry data. And for that, they made use of the HDF5 database backplane that uh, allow, that, that's really designed to, to scale to very large data sets. So, they created a variant of MZML that instead of being stored in an XML body, uh, as, as MZML is, was stored in an HDF5 database. So when you create an MZ5 file, you're creating a database that is extremely quick to read. Um, and if your tool can read MZ5, I would definitely recommend it as a, as a way to go. The, the information encoded within MZ5 is the same as it is within MZML. It's just a different form, a different formatting of it that allows for faster access. Okay, so I realize that's a little numbing, but it's important to talk through those those different data types because someday you'll be past a file and you've 
you've got to figure out what to make sense of it. You know, I, I would say that probably the biggest goals for us in supporting metabolomics would probably be supporting uh, formats like NetCDF better than we do. Um, NetCDF is um, another uh, encoding system that we've seen used in especially GCMS data sets. And right now that's not supported at all. Um, so it may be that you have a LECO instrument or something like that. You can export to NetCDF, but so far the linkage to ProteoWizard is not complete. Okay, on we go. As I mentioned, uh, there's a world of these filters to go through. And this, this set is probably the easiest of them all to explain. Uh, all of these function to allow you to filter out one block of spectra from a, a very large set of them. So it may be uh, that you simply know the ordering of your scans. Uh, you know that there are 10,000 scans and that they're each numbered sequentially in the order they were captured, like a thermophile. Uh, for something like that, you can simply provide the index uh, of a particular scan. If, if you are working with an MGF file, uh, you know that each, uh, each of those scans is going to receive an, an index number starting with zero at the first one and then one and then two and then three. So if you wanted to pull out, say, the second block of 50 scans, you could do that by giving a range of 51 through 100, for example. MS level is just what it says. It, it may be that you, when you're exporting an MZML file, you don't care about all those MS scans. Maybe you only care about the tandem mass spectra. In a case like that, you can specify that MS level must be 2 in order to retain those spectra. Uh, charge state is another possibility. If you're interested in, uh, if you're working through a lipid set and you want to ignore anything with high charge, you can specify that it must be a charge of 1 to be retained, for example. Or if you're interested in cardiolipins, you can go ahead and open it up to 1 through 2. Uh, scan numbers are like indexes, but the scan numbers um, map more closely to what you uh, would see in a thermo instrument. Not everyone, if you've always worked in thermo instruments, you may, you may think that everyone uses scan numbers, but that's not actually true. Uh, if you're working with a WIF file or a uh, or a waters file, the way that scan numbers work is completely different. Uh, you, you have scan functions and, and those, uh, you know, whether something is the, uh, is the first MSMS collected after the MS scan or the third is going to depend on which function it ends up with. So uh, these, a lot of these uh, early filters have been built around notions that are thermospecific and Breaking out of that is, has always been a bit of a challenge, but I, I think we've got, actually got a pretty well-rounded set of tools for that. It may be you're interested in pulling out retention time ranges, and for that, the scan time event is useful. We've had uh, some people who collect ther in, on thermo instruments that are hybrids, like an orbit trap. They'll collect a tandem mass spectrum in the trap and in the, uh, uh, in the FT, uh, in, in the orbit trap uh, area. So if you've got the same scan collected both ways, you may want to strip them uh, uh, strip out the, the eye trap ones, for example, and let the orbit trap ones pass through. So you have that option. Uh, sometimes you're really interested in looking at the data that support particular precursors, and you can certainly pull out very narrow ranges of precursor masses as you're doing this. So you're not required to have an MZML file that, that contains all the data of the original. You can certainly create a very sensible subsets using these methods. I'm not sure why default array length exists. It doesn't seem like a very useful thing, but if you only wanted to capture tandem mass spectra with 100 peaks, exactly 100 peaks, or 95 to 100 peaks, you could do something like that using default array length. I have no idea why, that, why that's in there. Activation, however, is very useful because there are plenty of search engines that, uh, that don't have the ability to change fragmentation modes depending on the fragment type. Uh, so if you need to export ETD scans separately from CID scans, separately from HCD scans, Pretty Wizard has you covered. <laughs> so uh, the activation type allows you to do stuff of that sort. Likewise, you may have multiple mass analyzers. I mean, heaven help you if you're operating a fusion, right? You've got all these different options of where to capture your fragments. So the mass analyzer number can be used to separate out scans of different, uh, from different analyzers. And of course, uh, metabolomics dealing with polarity is going to be a fairly big deal. You may have conducted an experiment in which you have positive mode scans and then negative mode scans of the, of the same species, and uh, you can deal with that through polarity. 
So that's a bunch of mumbo jumbo in some respects, but we can look at these examples and try to be very concrete about what we're trying to accomplish. So here's some examples of how we would do subsetting. Let's start with, I want to exclude the MSMS scans from these data because I'm just doing this in XCMS. XCMS doesn't care about the tandem mass vector, right? So we'll just deal, we'll just deal with chromatograms built out of MS1 scans only. And for that, we can use the, this filter for MS level to filter out anything that is uh, not MS level 1. This uh, forces it to write them to MZ XML format. Remember, some software can't read MZ ML. Um, and at least for some versions of XCMS, you only have the ability to work with MZ XML. So this forces the format to that format, and it'll process any raw file um, into that format. So that's, that's our, our first example. Next, I want to extract scans for all those peaks that are near 18 minutes, which is about 1,080 seconds, in this set of files. So we have some peak that's showing up around 18 minutes. We want to know what it is. So this is, this is how we go after those. We can run our MS convert with our scan time filter, here saying that anywhere between 1050 and 1110 seconds is OK. And we're going to just process those raw files. So this is going to kick out MZML files, one for each raw, that contain just that narrow range of scan times. All right. Um, if you want just the negative ion mode scans, the uh, the user interface is pretty straightforward on that. Just MS convert, filter, polarity negative, raw. So out pops an MZML file that contains just those polarities. OK, any questions so far? Some of these filters are available within the MS convert GUI. And that can certainly be a lot handier to use than the command line. But um, I'm, I'm giving the directions on the command line so that you know how to extend them. because. The odds are you'll probably want to do these in combination. That, uh, you know, that if, if, for example, you're going after some ion that shows up at a particular retention time, 18 minutes, it's also likely that you're interested in narrowing the m over z range that, that's being considered to this very narrow range. So these, these filters are stackable. And it's worth knowing how to do it on the command line for that reason. All right. Um, the processing filters are not about this subsetting stuff anymore. These are really about doing computations with the data and working out um, how, to, how to get at just the data sets we want. So here, here we have a precursor recalculation, the ability to recalculate precursor M over Z in charge uh, based uh, for the MS2 spectra. So if you, have, uh, if you have some precursors, the instrument has already provided you an M over Z value for where that, where that came from. And it's also given you a retention time for that. So that's great. Um, sometimes, though, the software that's providing these precursor M over Zs and charges, is having, they're having to work very rapidly. right? So when you produce a raw file in an Orbitrap, uh, it has uh, a vanishingly small amount of information to, to determine what the precursor M over Z and, retention, uh, sorry, and the charge date is. It has just that one MS scan. So you might imagine that you can do a better job at figuring out the precursor mass to charge value and its charge state if you have a set of MS scans instead. So that's what uh, precursor recalculation is all about. Uh, at present, I think our algorithms for that are fairly simplistic, but we've, we've uh, as, as we'll discuss at the end of the lecture, uh, we have uh, some much better systems now for pulling out charge states and precursors than were previously possible. All right. Uh, precursor refine, uh, we, that's what we're talking about. So uh, now for, for peak picking, uh, we have the ability to make use of the vendor provided software, uh, software libraries anyway, for peak picking, but only if we do that as a very first step on uh, data analysis. If we attempt to do peak picking, we cannot first do things like limiting to the top 100 peaks in intensity because Anything that is not what the instrument reported uh, uh, can't go through the software's peak lister. Basically, the peak lister has to be applied first. So if you're going to use the Agilent peak picker, you're going to use the Thermo peak picker, that absolutely has to be the very first filter applied. All right. Uh, and you're not required to apply it to all of the data that passed through. You can specify, as we did in, in uh, the GUI just a moment ago, that only the tandem mass spectra or only the MS scans should be peak listed. Uh, all right. 
Sorting by scan time uh, might seem like a very redundant step. Why would you sort by scan time? Because the files are already sorted, right? But in fact, some instruments are not sorted as we would expect. Um, and so uh, I believe when we've dealt with Waters instruments with XCMS, we have to add in this sort by scan time, otherwise the data get out of order and XCMS doesn't know what to do with it. The metadata fixer is kind of a, a curious little function. Uh, as we were working on uh, the, the uh, tool before Quometer for quality uh, control assessment metrics, uh, we found that the sums didn't add up if we did peak listing. And so we had to uh, modify them, uh, create a metadata fixer that will cause the uh, things like the base peak intensity to be as it appears in the spectrum, not as it was at the time the spectrum was reported. Um, when we write MGF files, we would like to store information in, uh, in the, the headers that allows us to relate that spectrum back to where it came from in the raw file. And for that, we have a title maker. Um, the, the options for how to operate that, I think, are things that you need to look up off the website. But it, we have the ability to write things like, I believe, even uh, the precursor intensity into these title strings. This charge date predictor. Uh, is our, our effort to infer the precursor charge on the basis of uh, isotope spacing in the MS scans. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a, a fairly advanced version of that as we move to the end of the talk, so I'm going to bypass that for now. So I already mentioned the example of waters uh, having uh, the, the need for sorting by scan time on the way to MZXML. So this is the example of how we would do that. Just use the filter, sort by scan time. It doesn't take any arguments. It's just if you, if you specify that, it's going to do it. Uh, we've of course already done this, except we did it using the uh, using the graphical user interface. One dash means one and everything above it. So this is kind of an open-ended, everything in the file gets peak picked. If you don't specify that you're going to use the vendor peak picker, it assumes you're going to. Uh, so in this case, we want to combine them both but we need to do our filtering up, upstream of the, of the other one. So this must always be the first filter. But when you apply two, you can just add on more dash dash filter strings. Whew. OK. Now we start getting into some dodgy stuff, and I have to remember this as we go. So, let, uh, so bear with me. Thresholding. Um, we want to do some cleanup within our spectrum Maybe we want to keep just the top peak, top 100 peaks by intensity. Thresholding is one of the ways that allows us to do that. So that is a possibility. All right, the MZ present uh, feature is kind of a, a curious one. We get to keep those data whose values meet particular thresholding criteria. So we can force the software to say only spectra that contain a certain fragment ion, for example, will be included in the file. Well, I believe I'm working through an example of that in the next slide. So I'm going to save it for the example. Um, all right, MZ window. So it may be that you have a pile of these spectra and you're, you're tired of seeing uh, stuff way up above 700 and you know your ion of interest has less than 700 mass. So the MZ window feature allows you to do that. Zero samples is curious because it may be that you're dealing with some downstream software, say for quantitation, that expects the peaks to be very clearly delineated, that it goes from zero to the high intensity, back down to zero, and so on. So you can put in bordering zeros with the zero samples feature. Or you may have an instrument that insists on putting in zero intensity peaks in the spectrum. You can throw them out this way. It may be that you need to denoise or de-isotope. We have these features built in as well. And it may be, heaven help you, that you're dealing with electron transfer dissociation data. ETD data have a host of extra ions in them that, uh, that can interfere with your life, uh, like charge stripped versions of the precursor, um, water loss to charge stripped versions of the precursor. And so you can strip those out using our very highly powerful ETD filter. Oops. All right, so let's walk through some examples. Maybe I am doing some fascinating work with carbohydrates. And I'm not interested in spectra, in attempting to identify spectra that don't have these sort of key ions within them. So uh, I believe that this 163 ion that I've mentioned is one that we see most frequently in peptidoglycans. So I'm interested in seeing this peptide that's got a sugar stuck on it, and I'm going to use the fact that it tends to throw off a hexose as my way of noticing that this spectrum is one that I care about. 
All right. So I need to specify that the spectrum must, uh, any spectrum to be retained must have within point, point, uh, within point 0.5 m over z, uh, <laughs> sorry, let me try unfolding this one a little more slowly. 163 is my target. I have an ion that I expect to be in the tandem mass spectrum at 163. Anything that falls within 0.5 of at 0.5 m over z of that is acceptable. I'll treat that as a hit. But I'm going to make a further stipulation that the ion that matches must be one of the 10 most intense peaks in the spectrum. So this 10 most intense rule is where that applies. So this kind of rule allows us to pull out only those tandem mass spectra that contain particular signature fragments. Okay. Uh, if I have any zero uh, intensity fragments and I want to strip them out, I can use the MS convert zero samples rule for that, the command that's written out there. And maybe I want to do deisotoping. Now, if I'm doing deisotoping, it implies that I know something about the chemical composition of that ion. So if I have a peptide, um, I can expect something to be true of its carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, nitrogens, and so on, that I can't presume if it's a, if it's a, a complex uh, oligosaccharide instead. So, uh, if I'm doing something like that, um, using my Poisson model that assumes that this thing is a peptide is not going to be viable for me. But this is what we've got built into the system right now. The, the expectation that, the, uh, that the, the fragments that have isotopes will have intensities that represent um, basically small peptides. Okay. Whew. All right, I realized that, that was kind of grilling, at least it was for me. Um, so, I'll take a moment of, of thought. Great. Let's move on. What, when, when, we, when we were looking at where we stood about a year and a half ago, uh, we realized that we had some instruments that we supported brilliantly well, and some that we really didn't. Um, and understanding what, what were strengths and weaknesses for us at that point, really helped guide where we went with uh, a postdoc who came to our group uh, in support of, um, of John Wixlow's efforts in conjunction with the McLean lab. So, um, Agilent, Brucker, and Thermo all had fairly conventional library functions available to us. If we were given a profile spectrum, we had a peak lister function. If we had a, uh, a precursor ion and we wanted to know what its charge was, the software could tell us by a function call. Easy. So these expected bits of functionality were all in these in these code bases without our really having to deal with them much. With AB SciX, we were in a somewhat different position. AB SciX's library uh, has gone through several different revisions over time, uh, and and yet some of the things that are offered by that library are not quite what we would like. The first is the peak picker, which is a very basic centroider and uh, works okay. Uh, and yet, AB SciX doesn't use that peak lister when they do identifications uh, through protein pilot or Paragon. Uh, they use a different peak lister when they're running it through their search engine, and they don't trust the one that they've actually put in the library. So that's an uncomfortable place to be. Um, if we want to see how multiple search engines compare on the same WIF file, um, we have to have some sort of way to to relate these results to each other. So that was not comfortable. And as I said, we didn't get precursor charges. And certainly from a QTOF tandem, a QTOF mass spectrum, you can infer precursor charge most of the time. Waters was really, really challenging for us. And this, this condition lasted several years. Uh, and Waters expressed a lot of desire to, to meet us in the middle and, and make this work. But we never did get libraries that gave us all the functions we needed in order to do standard operations with uh, an experiment from them. Especially when it came to MS to the E data sets, um, which are very special indeed. So we really needed to have the ability to do MCML exports from these. Now, helpfully, AB SciX has a tool, I believe still in beta, but that works quite well uh, for MS data conversion. Uh, and our friend Sean Seymour set us up with a, a license to that, and we were able to make use of that. So at the very least, given a WIF file, I can run this free converter that's available from the company and get MZMLs that I can use. 
with Waters, we weren't in that position. Waters created a MZML exporter in their Protein Links global server software, um, and yet the MZMLs that we got from it did not seem to uh, represent the data as we would expect. For example, we expect that each MS scan that's been collected at a different point in time will be exported as a separate MS scan, but their way of, of converting those data produced a single MS, apparently a single MS scan with all of the data summed together, which didn't seem very useful to us. So that was a problem for us. Um, however, there's a commercial product, this mascot distil distiller software, that allows us to kick out MGF files that represents tandem mass spectra. So if we need to convert to, uh, if we need a, an external reference for how do we compare, we have that as a, as a basis. Uh, and uh, Matrix Sciences gave us a beta uh, to test against with that. So that was very nice. Or a short-term license, I should say. So dealing with Waters data sets was something that we really needed to do to have any sort of presence in, in the metabolomics world. So uh, we needed to implement functions that were provided by other vendors uh, in open source to support, uh, support these instruments. So first off, we need to be able to enumerate peaks. So given peak profiles, we need to be able to write in our own M over Z values and intensities that are representative of these, of these profile peaks. We need to be able to infer precursor charge. We've got some spacing of peaks in an isotopic packet in the MS scan. We need to be able to infer precursor charge from that. And we needed to be able to deal with subscans. Some of the instruments produced by Waters don't record all of the information for each mass spectrum or each tandem mass spectrum in a single scan. Instead, they split that information out to the various subscans. That gives you the ability to play the signals in one subscan off of those in another. So valuable, but we need to be able to con condense those down to, to collapse those packets uh, down to a single scan in order to make better sense of them. So our goal would be able to produce MZMLs for identification just as easily for these uh, for Waters instruments as we can for others. Uh, we needed to have a high quality open source implementation for how to do peak picking to compare against what other vendors are doing. So whether, whether we're applying this in Waters instruments or not, we wanted to be able to generate a peak list that reflected our method for doing it. Uh, and of course, wouldn't it be nice if we could even improve upon the mass accuracy that's delivered by these vendor libraries? If we're able to make use of information you know, several seconds before and several seconds after to really refine these mass to charge values, that would be very powerful. This is a trick that's been done in MaxQuant, for example. So what we've done is to create a really high-end peak, pick, peak picker that's applicable in Waters instruments. And for this, we've used a trick called continuous wavelet transform, um, which is why we call our method can't wait, as you can see. That also sort of fits in there. So, um, we needed the ability then to, uh, to map what are called Ricker wavelets to the, the data that we've observed. A Ricker wavelet is more frequently called a Mexican hat wavelet, so it's a, a curve sort of like that. So they, they, uh, mapping these Ricker wavelets, uh, we have sort of a, a scale parameter that tells us uh, whether it's wide or narrow, and we have kind of a magnitude uh, that, that gives us um, that, that, that can be mapped against the intensity that we've observed. So when we do this mapping, we end up with a plot that looks something like this. So here's our M over Z axis, and here is the, the wavelet scale that we're comparing to it. So uh, the higher the scale, the more intense the peak, and sort of broader it is as well. Um, so when we have a very high correlation at a particular scale at a particular M over Z, that's telling us that we have a peak located at this horizontal position that's got a magnitude of this much. Uh, sometimes the, uh, the best correlation is low, and sometimes it's high, depending on how intense that signal is. Um, basically, the, the, greater the, uh, the greater the redness of that, of that point, the better the correlation is. So the, the Ricker wavelet is making a prediction about how intense the signal should be at a particular M over Z. And the correlation is high if that's a very good match with what we had in the spectrum beneath it. Oh, I'm sorry, the other piece of this is that we need to be able to do charge data inference. And so we've written a tool called TurboCharger for doing that. And TurboCharger is going to evaluate 
both the intensity of the uh, of the associations between um, where the software thinks these uh, these peaks should be, and a, a, a careful check on the MZ fidelity. So we have some predictions about what M over Z's these uh, peaks should appear at um, if if it were this charge, and so we want to see that. Uh, the predicted locations for the peaks match very well to their observed locations in them on the M over Z scale. So we have some very complex options then that correspond to this open source peak listing. So we have turbocharger, and we've already talked about um, de-isotoping. The de-isotoping code got quite a lot better as part of this process as well. So we can specify a minimum and maximum range on the charge. Uh, I would just point out that there are some aspects in which mapping charge to isotopes gets really messy. Uh, for example, the difference between a pair of plus two ions that happen to be very close in M over Z in intensity uh, and a plus four, which has uh, ions appearing every 0.25, can be very hard to discern. So uh, this is actually a much more challenging problem than, than you might think. So, uh, so turbocharger is going to handle this association between uh, of, between charge and a particular precursor. Scan summing will handle the, uh, the accumulation of, of scan information back into a single spectrum. And the peak picking will handle the sense writing um, for, for us. So how these get called looks something a little like this. So can't wait does the <coughs> continuous wave transform business. So it needs to be peak picking CWT MS level two. So in this case, we're specifying that only the tandem mass spectra are going to get peak picked. And one of the reasons, one of the most obvious reasons to do that is that MS scans generally have a lot more peak information in them than do MS2s. So uh, if you have a lot more samples across the spectrum, it takes longer to do the, uh, the CWT operation. So that's why uh, Can't Wait most frequently was tested in uh, MSMS spectra. Uh, our turbocharger looks something like this. So, you see that we've specified the half isolation width here. That really comes into play because when you are inferring the charge for a precursor ion, you need to know uh, which ions from the MS scan were allowed into the tandem mass spectrum, essentially. That if you have, uh, if you have a very wide isolation width, say in SWATH or MS of the E experiments, certainly, um, you have a wide variety of precursor ions that might be collected uh, for the fragment uh, to produce the fragments that appear in the tandem mass spectrum. So we needed to know how big that is. Now with a thermal instrument, the half isolation width is provided as part of the MZML data model. But not every instrument provides isolation widths. So we had to have the ability to specify what those ranges should be. Okay, so for us a typical uh, a typical command to launch this uh, this conversion process is going to have peak picking using can't wait, focusing on the tandem mass spectra. We're going to filter out. Uh, we're going to apply the filter turbocharger to figure out the precursors with half isolation width. Maybe you set up your instrument so that uh, it wasn't collecting any plus ones. In which case, you may want to uh, add to uh, turbocharger that the minimum charge allowable is two. Okay, so. Uh, and then uh, finally a filter to MS2 the isotope using the Poisson model. From that, we get peak lists that we can use for database searching and so on. Um, of these, the only thing that isn't uh, probably relevant in the, uh, uh, in the metabolomic field is the, the dangerous Poisson model here, because we assume that we're going to have an elemental composition resembling a peptide. And if that's not true, that, that's not going to work so well. So if you've got a lot more oxygen relative to others, then you know having a kind of the gap tooth uh, uh, isotope profile is might be might be what we expect. Whew. Okay. So uh, we can do an awful lot of stuff with MS Convert, um, and if you're just using it to convert file formats, we're happy for that. But there's a whole lot more that you can do. Um, I particularly think that the ability to uh, filter on the basis of contained fragment ions can be very, very helpful in a wide variety of circumstances. We use it in proteomics to find peptidoglycans, for example, but uh, there are lots of, lots of ways that that can be applied. Um, so certainly you can do these things. Some of them are accessible within the GUI. Most of them, I think, require the command line still. 
Uh, you may be uncertain whether the peak lists you're getting are what you really want to be using. We have an alternative means for you to look at, and uh, we hope that uh, we hope that that will be uh, a robust uh, technique for you to use. Now, I note that the processing required uh, for the can't wait filter can be a little more substantial. Um, we'll be doing, attempting this on a, uh, an Intel i3 here, um, which is not the fastest computer ever made, but hopefully um, you'll find that when you run on your desktop, it's uh, satisfactory in speed.